Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Kristen Talbot. I'm the program manager of the MAVEN project. Uh, and I welcome you to this direct relief education series, a monthly series on a variety of topics for the primary care provider. It has been a pleasure for MAVEN project to partner with direct relief. And I'd like to briefly tell you about the two organizations. MAVEN project is a telehealth nonprofit that supports primary care providers working at safety net clinics across the country. Our experienced volunteer physicians offer provider to provider medical consults, one-on-one -on -one mentoring and medical education sessions. Direct Relief is a humanitarian organization committed to, to improving the health and lives of people affected by poverty and emergencies, delivering life-saving medical resources throughout the US and world to communities in need without regard to politics, religion, or the ability to pay. For more information, visit www.directrelief.org. Today, we are excited to present Hypertension Update 2023, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Charles Schulman. Dr. Schulman was an assistant clinical professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School from 1988 until 2016. He is currently a corresponding member of the faculty of Harvard Medical School and a senior physician at the Beth Israel Deaconese Medical Center in Boston. In addition, he has been practicing non-invasive cardiology since 1970. Dr. Shulman's scientific articles and abstracts have appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine, Circulation, the American Journal of Cardiology, and the British Heart Journal. His research, interests, his research interests include the treatment of hypertension, congestive heart failure, and hyper, hyperlipidemia. Please mark your calendars for the following direct relief sponsored and partner talks. Uh, direct, uh, they're upcoming uh, on Wednesday, May 10th, uh, Long COVID with Dr. Deborah Gold. On Friday, May 19th, uh, the Dermatology Series, Dermatological Signs of Internal Disease with Dr. Jeanette Okoye. And on June 14th, the pharma Pharmacological Treatment of Anxiety Disorders with Dr. Judy and Smith. With that, Dr. Shulman, I will have you, sh uh, sh well, you are sharing your slides, so feel free to begin. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kristen, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone, or or morning, wherever you are. I'm in the I'm in Boston, which is the Eastern Time Zone. Um, <clears throat> uh, and those of you who were in the uh, in other parts of the country may uh, it may not be afternoon yet. Um, uh, in any event, um, this is a, a topic which is uh, uh, ex extremely uh, common. Uh, it, it involves uh, many of our patients, uh, whether they're cardiology patients or uh, primary care patients. And so there are a number of considerations um, uh, that we need to take into account uh, as we uh, face our patient. Uh, Okay. Okay. There we go. Um, so uh, hypertension is a per per a pervasive problem, as as I've already said. 116 million people in the United States are thought to have blood pressures that are greater than 130 over 80. Uh, uh, many of whom are not controlled. Uh, hypertension is as a primary or contributing cause. Uh, of uh, upwards of uh, 500,000 deaths in the United States, and the costs, uh, as you can imagine, are considerable. Um, there's an increase in the prevalence of hypertension with age. This is data from the National Health and Nutrition uh, Survey, uh, or surveys, plural, uh, over, the, over the years, um, showing that both in, in men and women, uh, uh, the the prevalence of hypertension uh, uh, rises with age, so that uh, uh, over the age of sixty five, uh, you see that over sixty percent of the population has hypertension, and over the age of seventy five, uh, that that's even higher. Um, uh, multiple studies have shown that hypertension. As consequences, um, there's there you know I, I see people uh, being uh, diagnosed with quote benign and quote hypertension, 
In my opinion, there's no such thing as benign hypertension because if you have enough hypertension, you're going to have some consequences. We will discuss. Um, uh, in this meta-analysis of 61 studies of a, a million uh, uh, adults from uh, 20 years ago, uh, what you see are a series of curves. Um, uh, these are for di uh, systolic pressure, these are for diastolic pressure, and the curves depend on both age and blood pressure. As age goes up, risk goes up. As blood pressure goes up, risk goes up. Um, uh, again, multiple meta-analyses have reported a gradient of progressively higher cardiovascular uh, risk uh, when you go from normal blood pressure, 120 over 80, to elevated blood pressure, to actual hypertension. Um, and so, uh, before we get into uh, uh, di either diagnosis or, or it, before we get into diagnosis and treatment, uh, I'd like to review this particular study. The SPRINT study was an NIH-sponsored uh, study published in 2015 of um, uh, 9,300 uh, uh, patients. It was a randomized controlled trial uh, to examine the effect of uh, a more intensive uh, blood pressure uh, treatment than uh, the, the, what was the standard treatment at the time, which was uh, a goal blood pressure of 140 over, uh, over 90. So the, the, there were, the, the patients were divided into two groups. Uh, the entire group was about 35% female, 28% of them were over the age of 75, and 30% uh, of them were African Americans. They were randomized into two groups, one with a gold blood pressure of 140, one with a gold blood pressure of 120. The primary outcome was a composite of myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, stroke, heart failure, or death from cardiovascular disease. Uh, the inclusion criteria uh, were that a patient had to be over 50, uh, have a blood pressure that was higher than, uh, that was between 130 and 180 millimeters of mercury, uh, and, and the patient had to have at least one other uh, risk factor. An exclusion was diabetes, which all of us would consider to be a risk factor. The reason diabetics were excluded is because the NIH had previously done a study in diabetics. So it wanted this study to be in non-diabetics. If you had a stroke, had polycystic kidney disease, already had uh, heart failure uh, or, or, or age four uh, kidney disease, but then uh, those folks were excluded. Uh, the achieved blood pressures were uh, 121 in the intensive treatment uh, arm and 136 uh, in the standard treatment arm. And here are the results. And the results are that in the study as a whole, uh, there was a statistically significant uh, improvement in the primary outcome and in all cause, all cause mortality with a hazard ratio, a hazard ratio of 0.75. That is, there was a 25% reduction. Uh, even patients who were over the age of 75 benefited from uh, the intensive. Uh, in fact, they benefited more than the group as a whole uh, with a 34% uh, reduction, or 25% reduction. Uh, of course, uh, nothing is, you know, nothing is without side effects, and there was more hypotension and more uh, falling in the uh, treatment group. Um, <clears throat> this shows results of benefit uh, uh, risk reduction achieved by lowering systolic pressure to under 130 uh, millimeters of mercury in, the, in these two studies. And, and diastolic pressure to under 80 in the, in the lower study. And you can see that various uh, cardiovascular endpoints 
uh, are all reduced, including all cause of death. Uh, this I found to be particularly interesting. Um, this is data from the uh, uh, Framingham study. And what it shows is, uh, excuse me, this is not the Framingham from the blood pressure lowering treatment trialist collaboration, 6,400 uh, patients in the treatment group, and uh, 64,000 patients in the treatment group, and 80,000 patients in the comparative group. Uh, and uh, the endpoint was the risk of new onset type 2 diabetes. And it turns out that uh, regardless of your body, of your BMI, there was a reduction in type 2 diabetes with blood pressure treatment. Uh, and that, that treatment, uh, the treatment which was most effective in that regard were the angiotensin uh, uh, converting enzyme inhibitors, the uh, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, but beta blockers had the opposite effect. So uh, when your patient comes into the office, uh, to have their uh, blood pressure evaluated. Um, there are three questions which you should uh, ask. Uh, well, were you rushing to get here or physically active right before this appointment? Uh, did you have uh, uh, several cigarettes before you came here? Did you have several cups of coffee before you came here? Have you been taking your medicine? Uh, and what's your diet and physical activity uh, regimen like? Uh, now, blood pressure technique, I like to talk about blood pressure technique because many people don't, don't measure the blood pressure properly. Uh, what you should, what the patient should be in a quiet room without talking. Uh, there should be no smoking, caffeine, or exercise for a half an hour before the me me measurement, uh, empty your bladder and relax for something like five minutes. In the chair with your back supported, feet on the floor, not crossed, uh, with the blood pressure cuff, uh, uh, a proper fit on the arm uh, uh, and uh, resting in. in uh, so, Paying attention to the, this technique uh, is important in uh, having taking accurate blood pressures uh, uh, so that we can properly assess people. Now, now in 2017, uh, uh, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association uh, issued this guidance for. Uh, prevention, detection, evaluation, and management of high blood pressure. Uh, the old guidance uh, uh, was, was by uh, something called the Joint National Committee for Things. Um, and there were seven prior reports. JNC7 was the most recent in 2003. There was a two thousand. There was a JNC8 that was convened, but it never issued an, an official report. Um, we'll talk a little bit uh, about about that, um, uh, and then here are the 2017 ACCA uh, guideline recommendations for blood pressure classification. Normal blood pressure is considered to be under 120. Uh, previously, between 120 and 140 was considered to be hypertension, and stage one hypertension was thought that. Uh, be present when blood pressure was greater than 140 over 90. Uh, stage two hypertension was 160 over 100. Um, the new guidelines, based at least in part on the SPRINT study that I just showed you, where, where there was benefit to reducing blood pressure to uh, in the 120s, um, uh, so they uh, defined uh, blood pressures between 120 and 130 uh, as elevated blood pressure and stage one hypertension begin at 130 over 80. Uh, stage two 
uh, over 140 over 90. Oh, the definition of high blood pressure is the blood pressure over 130 over 80. Um, consider that uh, abnormalities in sodium and fluid balance contribute to hypertension because they have a, a, a direct influence on volume status. Uh, the balance is generally maintained uh, in the kidney. Um, but if your patient is not a euvolemic, it will be uh, difficult to, to achieve uh, uh, goal blood pressures. Um, in addition, we need to consider the uh, role of aldosterone in hypertension. Uh, so that uh, primary aldosterone, uh, aldosteronism, uh, is thought to be present in about 6% of all hypertensives. Uh, the role of aldosterone in, in the production of uh, hypertension is that it causes sodium, uh, sodium retention and uh, volume expansion, upregulation of angiotensin II receptors, and the potentiation of the pressure response to angiotensin. All of those three things lead to um, uh, hypertension. Uh, it also causes, uh, in addition to sodium reabsorption, it causes potassium secretion, uh, which can lead to hypokalemia. So that if you have a patient who, who is hypokalemic or uh, uh, especially hypokalemic with, with one of the diuretics, I think uh, aldosterone. Uh, Hyperaldosteronism is, is associated with a greater incidence of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, microalbuminuria, and cardiovascular. Um, if you have hypertension, uh, long enough, there will be what's called target organ damage. And uh, uh, another way of putting it is that there are some, uh, there, there is, uh, if you have target organ damage, you have hypertensive cardiovascular disease opposed to tension. So there's a difference if, you're, if you do coding, if you do ICD-10 coding, then the codes are different and there's a uh, hypertensive cardiovascular disease for coding purposes is higher acuity. Uh, uh, for um, uh, thinking about the blood pressure, if you have uh, normal blood pressure at rest, but an exaggerated blood pressure response to exercise, for example, on a stress test, um, uh, in uh, blood pressure over two, 210 in men and or, and or 190 in women, that's considered to be an exaggerated blood pressure response with uh, hypertensive cardiovascular disease. Uh, another aspect of this is the loss of the nocturnal dip. Uh, if, if we consider the circadian variation in hemodynamics and catecholamine levels, then uh, uh, during the day, uh, uh, blood pressure heart rate and uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine levels are uh, increased as we spend active time during the day. And then when we sleep, uh, all fall uh, uh, with, with the, low, uh, the lowest uh, values uh, somewhere around four in the morning. Um, now, the, the dippers and non-dippers, that's a, a British term. Um, so the, the dipper, that means that you, your blood pressure goes down in the middle of the night, like this, okay? And a non-dipper, uh, blood pressure doesn't go down at night. Um, this would be particularly true of a patient with obstructive sleep apnea who doesn't really sleep. Um, it's been found that this, the, 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 the non-dipping uh, patients uh, uh, have, uh, uh, who were untreated, uh, had worse outcomes in terms of fatal and non-fatal cardiac. Um, uh, 
cardiac markers include left ventricular hypertrophy, either by electrocardiogram or concentric, even mild LVH on echocardiogram, uh, diet, uh, reduced diastolic relaxation, uh, uh, consistent with uh, diastolic dysfunction, uh, and coronary artery calcium, which is a sign of coronary arteries. Only way you can get coronary artery calcium in your coronary arteries is to have coronary artery disease. Uh, a vascular uh, measurement would be uh, carotid enamel medical enamel medial thickness. Uh, and renal manifestations would be microalbuminuria, um, uh, increased creatinine and reduced far uh, and retinal. Artery. Um, uh, one of the uh, important uh, common endpoints uh, from hypertension is heart failure uh, through two mechanisms. One is the, the development of atherosclerosis uh, leading to myocardial infarction, uh, leading to cardiac remodeling, and what's called ventric or left ventricular hypertrophy, a uh, dilated heart. The other way is through cardiac remodeling due to afterload, uh, right? The afterload is the blood pressure that the left ventricle faces as it pumps blood out, the, out, out into the aorta. Okay. And this leads to concentric left ventricular hypertrophy and heart failure with a preserved ejection tract. People have a heart failure with a reduced ejection tract. Um, now, turning to uh, uh, treatment, uh, this is the 2017 hypertension guidelines. The treatment target is 130 over 80. And uh, uh, this points out, uh, like with a lot of things, that the most intensive treatment should be uh, reserved for the uh, thickest. So uh, we divide uh, the patients into lower risk and higher risk. Uh, consider those with a 10-year risk of less than 10% when, when evaluated according to the um, uh, ACC AHA uh, risk uh, e evaluation. Uh, you can, if you don't have that, uh, there's an app for it. It's called the PSCVD uh, Risk Estimator. You can get it on your uh, cell phone um, you can calculate, or on your uh, desktop computer. Um, you can calculate that for uh, your patients and, and get some sense of uh, their, their overall risk for cardiovascular endpoints. So if uh, your patient has a 10 year risk of less than 10%, uh, if their blood pressure is in the 120 to 130 range, uh, uh, promote a heart healthy lifestyle. If they have stage one hypertension with blood pressures over 130, uh, over 80, uh, again, uh, intensify, intensify the lifestyle. Uh, if they have a blood pressure of greater than 140 over 90, that's when you should begin uh, uh, if on the other hand your your patient's risk is greater than 10 percent or they have diabetes or they have chronic kidney disease and at the lower levels uh, heart healthy lifestyle uh, is recommended but pharmacotherapy should begin uh, when after the blood pressure is over 130 over 80. the treatment target again is 130 over 80. Um, people are concerned about older patients. You know, it happens that too much. Um, and the ACC, AHA, so the, the different um, uh, medical groups have different recommendations as a term. Uh, ACC, AHA, based on the guideline that I've just shown you, uh, is uh, the recommendation is to lower systolic pressure to 130, between 130 and 139. It's close to 130, get it. Uh, uh, but with certain caveats, you know, one is if it's well tolerated and you should take into account 
the patient's biologic age, but also comorbidities, uh, uh, non-cardiovascular comorbidities, frailty, and dependency. Um, the European uh, Society for Cardiology recommends lowering systolic blood pressure to 140 or under 140 uh, over the age of 70 and down to 130 if tolerated, but not, but not below 120. The American Association, uh, uh, the American Academy of Family Practice, uh, did, never did buy into the 2017 guidelines. Um, and so for the longest time, they were recommending for older patients uh, uh, lowering blood pressure uh, to, to under 150. Recently changed that six months ago to uh, 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 treating uh, the threshold, the change the threshold for treatment for older patients to uh, uh, blood pressure, systolic pressure of 140. With the goal of under 140 or even under 135. Um, it's clear that in most studies, of one, uh, treating blood pressure over 140 over 90 is beneficial, even in those who are over the age of 80. And consider that treating blood pressure is beneficial, it's never too old to be treated. Um, since 2017, there have been a number of major findings, uh, uh, some of which, this is not all inclusive, but some of which are uh, listed here. Um, out of office blood pressure readings are recommended uh, both to uh, detect white coat hypertension and masked hypertension. Masked hypertension is where the blood pressure is normal in the office and elevated at home. Um, it's also uh, the most practical uh, method uh, to document blood pressures uh, for, for medication titration. So I will have my patients take their blood pressure on a regular basis. There are a number of ways of doing it. You can do it every day. You can do it three times a week. Um, uh, one of the hypertension experts from uh, Montreal recommends uh, have the patient take their blood pressure twice a day for a week out of the month. Uh, that way they're not doing it every full time. Um, uh, and I have uh, patients, you know, variable uh, uh, response to this. I, you know, a uh, patient who's, who's an accountant or an engineer may bring in a uh, uh, with averages for me. Um, uh, and, you know, someone else may come in with two or three blood pressures written on a piece of paper. Uh, I'll take what I, uh, from my point of view, I'll take what I can get. But the more, the more, data you have, the better uh, recommendation you can make. Um, all adults with difficult to control or resistant hypertension should be screened for primary aldosteronism. We'll, we'll get to that uh, a little later. Uh, remember that young adults with hypertension have an earlier, an earlier onset of cardiovascular events, so don't delay treatment. Lifestyle modification, in addition to improving blood pressure in and of itself, also improves the effectiveness of uh, pharmacologic therapy. Intensive blood pressure control is not associated with increased hospitalization, does not increase the risk of orthostatic hypertension to a significant degree. Um, uh, and uh, asymptomatic orthostatic hypertension in hypertensive adults is not associated with higher rates of cardiovascular events, syncope falls, or acute ren renal failure. So it may be a, a, a you know, to reduce uh, the, the dose of uh, medicine, but it wouldn't be a re reason to withdraw medicine altogether. For older patients with uh, hypertension, blood pressure lowering may or at least partially uh, rest of cognitive decline. Uh, hard, it's hard to measure, but it appears to be the case. And uh, multi-level, multi-component multi impl implementation strategies, uh, including team-based care, are the most effective methods to uh, for blood pressure. Um, these are non-pharmacologic non interventions for the prevention and treatment of hypertension and uh, showing, all, uh, in addition, the approximate impact on uh, blood pressure. Uh, weight loss, 
uh, every kilogram of re uh, weight reduction can lead to a millimeter of mercury reduction in blood pressure. Uh, the DASH diet pattern, which is a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, vegetables and, and low fat, um, it's also low in salt. Um, uh, it's a similar, similar to, but not exactly the same as the Mediterranean diet. Uh, well, the Mediterranean diet will have more fat because it will have olive oil. But you, see, you can you can achieve uh, you know ten millimeters of uh, or eleven millimeters of uh, blood pressure uh, with diet alone. Uh, reduction in dietary sodium, uh, increase in dietary potassium, and physical exercise. Um, regular physical exercise can lead to. Uh, lower blood pressures in uh, hypertensive individuals. Uh, the recommendation of the exercise uh, uh, guidelines uh, are for somewhere between 90 and 150 minutes of aerobic exercise. So uh, 30 minutes, uh, five days a week, three, between three and five days a week. Um, you don't need to do vigorous in order to get the benefit, you will get the benefit. Actually, you tell your patients that everything counts. Uh, if, you, uh, if you can't exercise for a half an hour, three times 10 minutes will, will uh, achieve the same result. Uh, walking uh, has the same uh, benefit as running, just takes, takes longer. Moderating alcohol consumption uh, helps. Uh, it will be difficult to control your patient's blood pressure uh, if he drinks three or more uh, uh, drinks uh, in, a, in a day. And um, CPAP for uh, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, more than four hours a night has led to a five uh, millimeter mercury uh, reduction in blood pressure. And you see a seven millimeter reduction at night uh, tested uh, by uh, ambulatory blood pressure. Um, considering the choices of therapy uh, in hypertension, the basic, the major uh, determinant of blood pressure of the major determinant of cardiovascular risk, risk reduction uh, is the amount of blood pressure reduction and what your blood pressure becomes, not which medicine you take, uh, with a couple of exceptions. Uh, one is that uh, the accomplished trial showed that the combination of uh, ACE inhibitor and dihydropyridine uh, calcium blocker was superior to an uh, ACE inhibitor and a diuretic uh, in terms of outcomes. But, and then there are certain comor comorbid conditions which may have non blood pressure indications for medications. So heart failure or diabetes might would be a indication for an ARB. Uh, atrial fibrillation would be an indication for aiding you know, the blocking drugs. Uh, uh, and uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction uh, would be in spironolactone. Uh, each class of uh, uh, hypertensive agent led to a good response in something like 30 to 50 patients, but there's a very wide interpatient variability to drugs, uh, so that if you stop the first one and start a second one, the result may be in the same ballpark. Um, the most common causes of the re uh, lack of response uh, are medication non-adherence, uh, a white coat effect, uh, and improper blood pressure measurement. So the approach uh, uh, that's recommended to antihypertensive drug therapy is uh, number one, counsel that your patient of lifestyle and event. Uh, reduce salt intake, uh, weight, uh, increasing their activity. If is then uh, ask, is the systolic pressure more than 20 millimeters of mercury above the goal, above goal, 20 over 10 above goal? If it is not, and there is not uh, microalbumin or, well, albumin, well, this would be microalbumin. Uh, then start either an ACE uh, or a calcium channel blocking agent, dihydropyridine calcium blocking agent. If the blood pressure remains uh, uncontrolled, 
either either try the other one or add the other one. Um, uh, if there is significant uh, a protein in the urine, start with a, an ACE inhibitor or an um, uh, If the blood pressure is greater than 20 over 10 above the goal, uh, so we're talking about 150 over 90 or, or up, uh, uh, the guidelines recommend starting both uh, an ACE inhibitor and, and dihydropyridine calcium. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then if if those don't control your blood pressure, uh, add a thiazide like diuretic. <clears throat> uh, reassess after two to four weeks, um, right? Don't give the patient three, three to six month follow up appointment. Make some arrangement to get more, see them more often. Uh, combination therapy is often better than the maximum dose of the, of, of one med medicine. So to the highest dose has less value than adding a low dose of the second drug. Again, the most common causes of lack of response uh, are uh, medication non-adherence or the white coat of proper uh, blood pressure. Um, uh, this just po this points out that uh, in, in dapamide and chlorothalidone, uh, are bladder blood pressure lowering agents than hydrochlorothiazine. Okay. Um, uh, you know, a meta analysis of 19 randomized controlled study, it also, studies that also showed uh, less uh, stroke, cardiac events, or heart failure, but a recent direct comparison uh, was reported at the Heart Association meetings in uh, last November and did not find uh, a benefit benefit on on, uh, uh, on mortality. Whoops. Oh my, oh my. Hit the wrong button, sorry folks. Okay. Um, uh, these are the recommend recommendations of the American Dias Diabetes Association. And basically, they're the same as the ones I've just given you. If initial, you know, treat the, if there the initial blood pressure is greater than one thirty over eighty. Uh, okay, if it's uh, greater than one sixty over hundred, start two weeks. In either case, uh, lifestyle man management is indicated, and the progression is from one drug to two drugs uh, to three drugs, uh, depending on. Um, this is from the Kidney Disease Foundation, uh, uh, the guideline for the treatment of patients with chronic kidney disease, um, including uh, reduction uh, in salt intake and physical activity. Uh, and uh, the Kidney Disease Foundation uh, recommends a systolic pressure of under 120. Uh, and and that, that would depend, those goals would depend on on how much uh, proteinuria there is, you know, the the, the more proteinuria, uh, the the more higher the risk, uh, and uh, in, in higher the risk, and uh, could lead to an intensification of therapy. So, uh, considering there are some controversies about blood pressure goals. Um, uh, my general approach to uh, those goals is uh, not to let the controversies about the goals keep you from initiating treatment in the first place. Uh, don't let your patient tell you that I've always, quote, I've always had high blood pressure, uh, you know, therefore I don't want treatment. Uh, that's just not the case. Uh, I use a stepwise approach, aiming for a systolic pressure of under 140. If we get it under 140, then we aim for 130. Uh, again, smaller doses of two drugs may be more effective than pushing one drug to its maximum dose. And don't let the, the therapeutic inertia keep you from changing or up titrating medications. Um, you know, so that somebody did a study uh, where people were in the high, in the primary care clinics at the VA, and uh, often their blood pressures were uncontrolled and no no changes in treatment were 
made. Uh, so that, that, that's what's meant by uh, therapeutic energy. Um, now, there are a number of secondary drivers of hypertension, including uh, chronic kidney disease, uh, certain medications, uh, sleep apnea, and primary hyperaldosteronism. Remember, I, I talked about that earlier. Uh, look for primary, primary hyperaldosteronism in patients who have severe or resistant hypertension, who are hypokalemic, hypokalemic uh, who have obstructive sleep apnea, or have atrial fibrillation, which is uh, really unexplained. Treatment with uh, uh, spironolactone uh, or eplerinone can be can be very dramatic patients who have um, uh, about twenty percent of all patients who have hypertension will turn out to have resistant hypertension, uh, and uh, of those, three percent will be refractory. Um, so, uh, 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 what, uh, the definition of resistant hypertension is blood pressures of over 130 over uh, 80, despite three or more drugs, uh, including a diuretic. Um, and, you know, what are the causes you know, of optimal therapy? Poor adherence to therapy is probably the leading cause. Uh, you know, are you dealing with a patient with resistant hypertension or a resistant patient with hypertension? You get what I mean there. Uh, is there extracellular volume expansion, in which case you need a diuretic? Um, is there secondary hypertension, in which case uh, you may need to pay attention to that and treat it accordingly? Uh, if there's office or white coat hypertension only and blood pressures at home, are always normal. Uh, that's uh, that may be what you're what you're dealing with in terms of blood pressure or not. So, and the ingestion of substances which can elevate blood pressure, uh, you know, some of some of which are listed here. So moderate or heavy alcohol intake, um, uh, oral contraception, uh, and cause sodium retention. So you yeah, need to be cautious about that. I think that's not a primary uh, problem. It's not a, a severe problem, or, uh, but it can occur. The worst offender are the uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, uh, including the COX-2 inhibitors, both sodium retention and renal vasoconstriction. And you may not know that your patient is using uh, ibuprofen uh, you know, which he bought in drugs, you know, over the counter. Uh, steroids can, can uh, cause hypertension. Sympathomimetics and uh, amphetamine like substances uh, in either over the counter cold or allergy formulas, uh, or diet pills, or patients who have uh, uh, ADD or ADHD and are taking um, stimulant and then okay. Final one on my list. Uh, the secondary causes of hi resistant hypertension are commonly uh, uh, sleep apnea, renal parenchymal disease, primary aldosteronism, there it is again, uh, and renal artery stenosis. Uh, the uncommon ones are pheochromocytoma, uh, Cushing's disease, hyperparathyroidism, aortic coordination. Or if you, if you make a diagnosis of aortic coordination, you will be a hero. Um, uh, the, the, it's easy to suspect when or, an aortic coarctation is present because the blood pressure in the arms will be much higher than the blood pressure in the legs. So if you measure blood pressure in legs and compare it to the arms, uh, you may be able to make a diagnosis of uh, coarct of the aorta, uh, which is treatable. Now, you know, depending on the age of the patient, the, the may be permanent, but uh, uh, coarts are uh, treatable. Uh, uh, and then there are some cranial tumors, uh, pretty rare. Um, so, you know, what's the, the management approach uh, to resistant hypertension? Exclude other causes, 
you know, including white coat effect and medication non-adherence, ensure a low sodium diet, maximize lifestyle uh, interventions, and then optimize your three drug regimen. Uh, maximum or maximally tolerated. And the diuretic type must be appropriate for kidney function uh, with uh, kidney uh, with uh, kidney disease uh, and uh, GFR that's low, uh, you may uh, want to use a loop uh, rather than a thiazide diuretic. If the blood pressure is uh, still not at target, substitute a, uh, an optimally dosed thiazide uh, like chlorothaladone or endapamide for hydrochlorothiazide. Still not at target, uh, try uh, spironolactone or clearin. Uh, if it's still not a, uh, a target, uh, you know, steps four to six are uh, uh, add a beta blocker. If you're, you know, add uh, hydrolyzine uh, or uh, minoxidil. Uh, minoxidil is used to, to promote hair growth as well, uh, but uh, uh, good blood pressure medicine, we don't, we don't use it very much because it has to be used several times a day. Um, so we have, uh, you know what, I'm going to skip right here because we, I want to leave time. For um, so the keys to effective blood pressure control in adults with hypertension, uh, uh, some of them are, are listed here. Uh, uh, the patient and, and the provider should agree on what the blood pressure target is. Uh, use fixed dose combinations when you when you can in order to reduce the number of uh, pills that people are. Uh, substitute long acting chlorothaladone or endapamide for hydrochlorothiazide. Use long acting amlodipine as the first line calcium channel blocking agent. Uh, and uh, uh, you may recall that I said the follow up should be in two to four weeks. Um, uh, monthly. The, the recommendation uh, is going to be, it, you know, uh, whenever the guidelines are uh, uh, reissued, going to be monthly visits until blood pressure target is achieved. Uh, that's a way of uh, avoiding therapeutic. <clears throat> uh, uh, use 90-day uh, refills instead of 30-day refills. Uh, use telehealth health strategies. Um, uh, you know, hence an activity between the patient, the provider, and the uh, electronic health record. Um, uh, screen for social determinants of health and consideration of obstacles. Uh, we, in, in our clinic, we screen for social determinants of health. There, uh, I practice in, a, in an area of uh, Boston, which a very high uh, immigrant and uh, non-English speaking population. Uh, and so social, de social determinants of health are important. And uh, we try to train for and assist people with uh, optimizing uh, those issues. Uh, and then uh, use a multidisciplinary team-based care. So, uh, again, in our clinic, uh, my team consists of myself, uh, another doctor, uh, nurse practitioner, and a nurse, and then, then medical. So you know, utilize, utilize them all. Uh, if you uh, have pharmacies uh, available, uh, that's, that's beneficial as well. We have uh, uh, pharmacy, uh, farm, farm D clinical pharmacist who is hypertension. So um, as I say, I, I consider that we're, we're fortunate and well reported and uh, uh, many other clinics are not so, not so fortunate. And so, but the idea of team-based care is, is a, a valuable one. Uh, and with that, I will say, leave you with um, 
uh, leave you with a uh, card left over from Valentine's Day. Uh, this is this Valentine from the cardiologist. Absence makes the heart grow fonder, and beta blockers and ACE inhibitors uh, remodeling. Thank you very much. Uh, and I invite your questions. Uh, I put my email address here. If you, want, uh, if you have questions, you want to answer. Thank you, Dr. Shulman. Wonderful. As always, we already do have questions, but if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box, or you can also use the raise hand feature and speak directly to Dr. Shulman. First question, do you have any suggestions for isolated diastolic hypertension? Uh, not any more than the, uh, there, there's, there are no specific uh, drugs uh, indicated for di isolated diastolic hypertension. That's, that's much rarer than isolated systolic hypertension. But, uh, you know, uh, basically whatever works. Um, if potassium tanks on diuretic, is it better to add supplement, patients don't like them, or try a change to diazide, for example? Uh, well, diazide, uh, diazide is not a particularly strong uh, antihypertensive drug. Uh, it contains uh, uh, triamterine and hydrochlorothiazide. Um, uh, the triamterine, uh, 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 I have had uh, patients uh, become hypokalemic on that, on that drug. Uh, I would prefer spironolactone. Uh, there is a spironolactone hydrochlorothiazide combination. Um, or uh, so uh, that's the one. That's the one I prefer. Wonderful. Um, I don't see any questions, but we'll still pause and wait. Um, after you close out of this webinar, there will be a survey that pops up on another tab in your browser. We appreciate all your feedback. So if you could please complete that, the session is not eligible for CME, so it is a different survey. But we would uh, we really do appreciate appreciate all feedback um, and I can still stall for questions, but uh, uh, we really do appreciate everybody attending today. Um, you'll receive the slide deck and the recording link in about a week or two. It'll come from an email from MailChimp. How do you evaluate for primary hyperaldosteronism? Um, uh, measure, measure aldosterone to uh, uh, renin levels, uh, but you can I, you uh, you can just treat with spironolactone and see how you make out. All right, we'll still pause. Any last minute questions? Please feel free to submit them. Um, if not, Dr. Shulman, thank you. As always, it was a great presentation. Uh, we always appreciate when you come. Oh, one last question. What oh, is, oh. What, is yeah. what is frequency of labs after starting spirano? Spironolactone? Um, no, no, I, I, usually, I usually get uh, um, uh, Chem 6 um, two weeks after starting it. Uh, and then after the after that, perhaps every three months, depending. Uh, but, but you know, you want to get one relatively soon. Uh, uh, a, a week may not be enough. Uh, I mean, there's nothing. There's nothing very fixed about any of this. Um, but I, I usually do it about two weeks. Great. Um, we have a bunch of chats coming in and says, thank you, Dr. Shulman, excellent review. Thank you for the update, helpful information. So yeah, I'll, I'll second it. Thank you so much, Dr. Shulman. And thank you all today for joining us. Um, oh, and um, we'll see you hopefully next time for our upcoming sessions. Uh, just a reminder, our next session is on uh, long COVID on May 10th, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, but yeah, so thank you all today. Have a great rest of your day.